half past three, so I think we will make a start. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today, we're here to talk about CLL treatment for first line or the very first treatment you have um, as a CLL patient. And we are um, hosting this in uh, collaboration with Lymphoma Action. So maybe uh, Stephen could start off with um, instructions for us. Yeah, thanks. I'm Stephen Scowcroft, Director of Operations and External Affairs at Lymphoma Action. Um, this is a, a number of it's a series of webinars that we're doing in conjunction with Le um, Leukemia Care. Uh, and so we've got two coming up in the next week or so. More on that later. But uh, no, thanks, Charlotte. And we look forward to uh, what we've got in store today. Great. Right, thanks, Stephen. Uh, um, as I said, I'll, I'll be chairing today's uh, session with Stephen. I'm Charlotte. I'm the patient advocacy manager here at Leukemia Care. We're also joined by a really great panel today, a good mix of people. Um, and maybe I could start with uh, George. Would you mind just introducing yourself for me? Thank you, Sam. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen, for the invitation. Um, to join. So my name is George Follows. I am a consultant hematologist in Cambridge, where I have the clinical lead for the CLL programme and lymphoma. Um, I've been involved in the world of CLL for a long time. I was Peter Hillman's registrar back in the day. Uh, and so today I'm going to be talking you through a, a, just a snapshot overview of first line treatment of CLL. And then we'll be very happy to take part in the discussions as they evolve over the coming hour, hour and a half. Thank you. Great, thanks, George. And just before we go to George's talk, um, I'll just introduce the rest of the panel. So we're also joined by Helen today. Hi, Helen. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Helen Knight. I work as a nurse specialist uh, in Nottingham. It's a role I've been doing for about nine years now, but worked in haematology for about the last 20 years. Uh, and I'm here just to try and help give a point of view of how a nurse specialist can help you through um, your process of going through treatment. Thank you. Great, thank you, Helen. Um, and then, of course, we've got uh, patient perspectives today. Um, maybe, John, you could start for me. Hi, my name, I'm John Perkins. I've got CLL and diagnosed in 2015 and in 2018 had FCR. Perfect. Thank you, John. And last but, of course, not least, uh, Liz. You're on mute, Liz. <laughs> There we go, sorry. Um, similar a patient diagnosed in 2015 and on watch and wait until 2019. Great, thank you. Um, so final bit of housekeeping before I pass over to George for his presentation, just to um, say that we won't be allowing you to use the raise hand function or if you're familiar with Zoom to share your, uh, your video or to speak. Um, if you could instead place your comments in the chat um, and I have a colleague in the background collecting those for us and we will make sure we address all the questions that are asked. If you're watching us on Facebook today, we can also take questions via the comments section. Just pop it in the comments. Again, there is a, a colleague of mine collecting those for me and we will do our best to address them. So without further ado, if I could pass over to George for his uh, introduction to the topic. Thanks, George. Thank you very much, Charlotte. And may I reiterate, thank you very much to Leukemia Care and Lymphoma Action for this invitation. Isn't it amazing? It is an upside of Zoom and the modern era that we can all sit in our clinics or living room and have this type of interaction. That is one good side of what's been going on. So I have to kick off the talk just to flag the disclosures. I do a lot of work with the pharma uh, and biotech industry uh, at lots of different levels. Part of that is obviously, you know, trying to get new drugs uh, into clinical trials. I also work with non-NHS care providers so in the private sector, and I'm a director of the Genesis Care Group. So just to, and I will be touching on some NHS and non-NHS treatments. So watch and wait. This is still appropriate for the majority of new stage A patients in 2021. I know this is incredibly difficult for some patients, when they are diagnosed with the leukemia and we are not diving in to treat them. Um, but why do we stick with this principle? Number one, a lot of trials have shown that there is no survival benefit for early treatment of patients if they've got no symptoms. And so this has really become the mantra around the world that if you have a disease that you can't cure, so a patient will have this for whatever their duration of natural lifespan, that 
diving in with treatment if they have no symptoms is not going to improve their quality of life. And if it doesn't make them live longer, well, actually, why would you dive in to do that? Now, of course, many of my patients turn around to me and say, well, all of those trials were run in the chemotherapy era. So do we actually know that that holds true in the current era of new therapies? Well, we don't. The other question that comes up sometimes in clinic, it is it unknown whether if you treat early stage patients early, does that preserve the immune function or does it lead to more compromised immune function? Because any of our treatments we know that the treatments must potentially have side effects. I know a lot of the new therapies are very light on side effects in many patients, which is great, but they're not side effect free. And there are the risks that we will talk about. So um, we don't rush to give them to people with this hope that maybe it might improve immune function. As we get more data, we might change our opinions on that. And so the bit which I touched on there about the non-chemotherapy treatments that we're going to be talking about in this talk, and I'm sure discussing uh, as we go forward, but if we use these non-chemotherapy treatments now uh, early on, is there potential to improve long-term outcomes? There are uh, trials that are ongoing that might come up in some of the discussions. So there has been this remarkable evolution in the treatment of CLL, and this is really simplistic. I was putting these slides together at the weekend thinking, let's get some really solid themes here. So for 50 years, we were dealing with chemotherapy. The only evolution over that 50 year period was we added an antibody. So the Chester Beatty labs uh, soon after the war were fiddling with alkylators and along came chlorambicil. And actually there was a, a quite a rapid spell of development of these early tablets. They were used across the board in cancer and lo and behold, they found that when you gave these drugs sort of all deliver, all derived rather from mustine gas and all these other poisons, which I should know better about. But anyway, the history is quite interesting but they found that people's white cell count dropped. And so this was the first chemotherapy to treat patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. But over that huge period, a long period of time, the only true advance was adding in rituximab to therapy. And then again, all of it's simplistic, but over the last seven years, we've had this explosion of new therapies. And these, the ones that have made this big impact are targeting the different signaling pathways within the leukemia cell. And I'll be coming onto this later in this talk. And broadly grouped the PI3 kinase inhibitors, so that's idlalacib, or more recently, umbralisib from TG Therapeutics. Then we've got the BTK inhibitors, ibrutinib, and then the newer second generation ones, acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib. And again, we'll be coming back to these, and this thing called the BCL2 antagonist. So this developmental phase has really been packed in. And of course, it's not stopping there. There are so many things in the pipeline, uh, the non-covalent PTK inhibitors, so this LOXO drug that you'd have heard talked about. We've got toxin-tagged antibodies. We've got really clever bispecific antibodies that are dragging in your own immune defenses to attack cancers. We've got manipulated immune cells that come from either yourself or from other donors that manipulate in the lab and then infuse back. We call these chimeric antigen receptor cells, CAR-T and CAR-NK. The list goes on. And sometimes it can feel a bit overwhelming for patients, but I go back to simplistic things and say, well, look, think about your mobile phone. What did that look like 10 years ago? What does it look like now? And medicine is going through this similar rapid evolution. And sometimes it helps not to think hugely about the details, but just to think, oh my goodness, so many things are changing and more therapies are coming. Because for many patients with CLL, as I always say in my clinics, you're talking about that long strategic game. It is uncommon for decision making to be really forced and urgent decisions to be made in CLL. It's often strategic planning, trying to plan not just this year, but five years and 10 years and 20 years uh, into the future. So having said that, if we're trying to group our treatments that we have available for first line therapy in CLL, where well, we've got immuno chemotherapy, and as John has already mentioned, FCR, that uh, is absolute standard of treatment, which is still certainly there available for our patients. The monoclonal antibodies that I will be touching on are predominantly rituximab, which is this old drug uh, from Roche Genentech, which targets CD20. 
and the more recently developed one, abinutuzumab, which again targets the same surface molecule on CD20, but has a different structure to the antibody, so it kills cells in a different way. These B-cell receptor inhibitors that I've talked about, ibrutinib and acalabrutinib, and then the other things, venetoclax, uh, which is BCL2 inhibitor. I've got some slides coming. So how do these different things kill off cells? Chemotherapy, this is the easy one to think about because these drugs just go in, bash up the DNA and the cell falls apart. Now that's really simplistic, but sometimes I say to patients, imagine if your leukemia is a light shining in the room and chemotherapy is like going in with your sledgehammer and you sort of bash around and you hit the walls, you hit the things and eventually if you're lucky you whack the light bulb and out it goes. So it's this very non-specific attack. I then follow up by saying the new therapies is like you're going in and just switching off the light switch. It's a bit simplistic, but it's quite nice to think of them in that way, in a more targeted way of treatment delivery. But chemo is a general damage to DNA, which induces cell death. Antibodies, so we talked about rituximab and then abinutuzumab, they work in different ways, but the antibody recognizes proteins that are expressed on the surface of the cell. So antibodies are normally infused intravenously, sometimes given as a subcutaneous injection. They whiz around the body. These are big molecules and they actually hang around for quite a long time and they lock onto the cells and either induce direct cell death by the way they work, and abinutuzumab is a bit better at that than rituximab or they drag in other parts of the immune system to bring them in to attack the cell. And antibodies work very well with chemo. You'll see as the theme as we go along that if you target different pathways, different bits of why a cancer cell is alive, they can, all these treatments can work together. Now the B-cell receptor pathway inhibitors, this is the term I mentioned already. So within the B-cell, so just to recap, the CLL cells are this part of the immune system called the B cells, the clever bit of the immune system that produce antibodies in a specific part of our immune response to infection. But they, to live, depend on ongoing signals that come down from the cell surface from this bit at the top called the B cell receptor. Uh, B cell receptor. I'm clicking on here. I don't know whether you'll see my mouse, but there it is. And they come down through the BTK molecule and all these other signaling pathways that go down to the nucleus and say divide and live, divide and live. Now, all of those small proteins that are signaling, like the electrical wiring on the way to the light, they are actually key to keeping the cell alive because CLL is different from other cancers. It requires this ongoing microenvironmental stimulation and the cells are just living and dividing, but as part of an active process, they're not just dividing out of control. And that's why they can be targeted with these small molecule inhibitors so effectively. So these are working at the top part of the cell biology. Then along comes venetoclax. Now to understand how venetoclax work, I just have to do 30 seconds on cancer cell biology. So all cells have this ability to die and there's a process called apoptosis. Now apoptosis is where a cell says, you know what, you've gone wrong for whatever reason, you've got to die. And this is part of everyday life of the billions of cells in our body, because when they divide, things go wrong, the DNA is looped in the wrong way, or mutations, or your cells are getting old and they have to die off, and the body naturally triggers apoptosis. These proteins are then released, the cell gets chewed up, and it's all part of the natural life cycle within the human body. It's going on all the time. Now, there are, of course, whole mechanisms in place in biology which prevent apoptosis and whole mechanisms that drive apoptosis. And BCL2 is one of these very clever molecules. It's one of the master regulators of apoptosis. And BCL2 is uh, upregulated in certain cancers because it switches off, it's a master regulator, switches off the cell dying process. So CLL patients have a lot of BCL2 around. And so instead of the cells dying and apoptosing, they just stay alive. And venetoclax is a really clever molecule that sits in this thing, they call it BH3 mimetics. It sits in that groove of this molecule and inhibits BCL2. 
And it has this amazing developmental story from the guys in Abbott, uh, Abbott, Genet Abbott Therapeutics, as they were, I think it was, in Chicago. This guy who was running this project for years and years, and his lab was shrunk down, and then it expanded, shrunk down, until he finally got some data that told them that Abbott Laboratories was, yes, that he could stick with this program. And the whole thing led through to developing Venetoclax, this remarkable tablet that we are now using to treat CLR. So I'm sorry for all of that cell biology, but you need a little bit of an introduction to get a feel for where these drugs are coming from. So chemotherapy, immunochemotherapy is still out there as an option for our patients. And there are, of course, certain pros. Well, number one, we've been doing it for a long time. So the doctors in the clinic, the nurses uh, have all are all familiar and so they're aware of the side effect profile, what it's about and how we manage patients through it. Another pro of immunochemotherapy is a block of chemo. Well, it lasts for six months. So you have your block of treatment and then you walk away because the hope is you can push your disease into a deep remission. You can walk away from treatment for a protracted period and say, you know what? I've had that remission for five years or so. I'm gonna not think about my CLL and then I will rethink about it when the disease comes back. And this does introduce the concept of the functional cure. Because if you are, I'll give an example, 78 years old, six months of chemo, and then you die of a heart attack at 82, and you've not had further CLL therapy, then within the natural lifespan of that patient, they were cured of their CLL. So assuming that patient tolerated the treatment okay, you could argue, well, that was the perfect way to manage that patient. But there are, of course, cons of chemotherapy. Well, it's chemotherapy. Duh. <laughs> almost as you're saying as our patients when you're talking to them in the clinic the concept of chemotherapy is not hugely appealing for many patients for many reasons infections and hospital admissions are one but of course chemotherapy can make people feel pretty rubbish uh, that six month period people can just the general sickness diarrhea abdominal discomfort in and out of hospital uh, and it's almost that pain for gain concept that a lot of people will say look okay i will struggle through the pain of chemo for six months with this hope of getting a gain one of the other cons is in every prospective trial, the new drugs, the ones I've just touched on, are giving longer emissions. Now, I've put their longer survival as a bit more challenging. It's hard to actually say you live longer, but you are getting longer remissions. And the other concern is the short and long term toxicity for the immune system and bone marrow. So if you're having the chemotherapy, does that damage your body in a way that um, is going to leave you with problems? And Obviously, there's a lot of debate about some of the stronger, more potent chemo, such as FCR, and the effects that might have on patients. So how about the new drugs, these non-chemo drugs, ibrutinib, acalab, anatoclax, et cetera? What are the pros of these? Well, for the clear majority of patients, they don't feel ill on therapy. Now, there will be unlucky patients, and there are side effects, and you must hear what I'm saying. Nothing is without side effects in medicine. But we've been using these drugs now for really quite a number of years, and many patients uh, actually feel well when they're taking their drugs. So you don't have that dip of feeling rotten for six months then coming out to the other side. Often people feel well, and if they are unwell with the CLL, lethargy, night sweats, fevers, you often find by month two, month three, people are turning around saying, you know what, I actually feel really quite well. In every comparative trial, the new drugs keep patients in remission for longer. That is a fact. As it's chemo-free, there's this hope that there are going to be fewer longer-term side effects. Now, we don't know that, uh, but that is the hope. As I touched on, so the cons of the new drugs, like all drugs, there are potential side effects. Whenever you open a paracetamol package, you read, read all those potential side effects, but with the new drugs, they are there, and some of them are serious for patients who are unlucky. For the BTK inhibitors, ibrutinib, calibrutinib, these are open-ended treatments. So your doctor starts you on them, and they might still say helpful comments like, well, you're on that for the rest of your life or other things which are very emotive phrases that I try hard not to use, um, but they are open-ended. The license is continuous therapy until they are stopped because of progression, adverse events or patient death. Now, for some patients, that's quite stressful. They just don't like the concept of being on something 
for as, as a permanent open-ended thing. And other patients will turn around and say, well, look, I take my blood pressure tablets or a statin. It doesn't bother me at all. If you tell me I'm well, then I'm just not going to think about it. And it depends on the patient's view. The unknown unknowns. We are targeting part of the immune system with these drugs, of course, and long-term targeting. Well, these are the unknown unknowns. We've only been using drugs like ibrutinib for seven, eight, nine years. What happens when someone's been on for 10 years, 15 or 20 years? And you could invert that and say, well, actually, if you're 70 and you said to me, I'm going to take this drug for 20 years, I'm happy with that. And so, of course, it depends really on your philosophical point as a patient of what you choose to worry about more than other things and of course they are expensive the new drugs there's no doubt about it so the nhs your insurance company hope is paying for your treatment um, do they are more expensive than chemotherapy so i'm going to just touch on three clinical trials i don't want to talk for too long but these are influencing practice significantly in the uk so the first trial this is this american eastern cooperative oncology group the econ trial which was in younger patients and was comparing fcr which is this big international standard chemo against ibrutinib the ibrutinib was with rituximab uh, in this particular trial then we've got a couple of older trials, one which is a calibrutinib up front and the other which is the venetoclax of venetuzumab. So those two options are now available for routine use in the NHS. So it's important for us to be aware of them. So what did the ECOG trial show? So this was younger patients for which 17p deleted patients were excluded and they were randomised to either get ibrutinib with rituximab or FCR chemotherapy. Now, when this trial was first presented, it did take us a little bit by surprise for a couple of reasons. So, you can, number one, you can see this is what we call progression-free survival. And if you're not familiar with looking at Kaplan-Meier plots, this red line is the people who are on ibrutinib and with their tracked over time. So, by three years, 89% of them are still in the remission. The grey line is the FCR, and by three years, 72% are in remission. Now, if you're a pharmacoeconomic economist, you can analyze this data in all sorts of ways because you can talk about the number needed to treat and how many truly gained benefits, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line is more people in remission on ibrutinib than FCR. And that's an indisputable fact. Now, in this talk, I'm not really getting into discussion about molecular subgrouping, but I've allowed that one slide to stay and to remind us about the IGHV unmutated patients, where with the newer therapies, this particular group of CLR patients do seem to do disproportionately better with the newer therapies compared with chemo. But we can return to that in the discussion if we want to. But the bit that really took people by surprise was the mortality. So what we're at three years of follow-up, there was quite a difference in young people as to how many were actually alive. And what really jumped out that in this trial, in the 350 patients allocated to ibrutinib, there'd only been four deaths. So three to four percent mortality at three years, so around one percent per year in a cancer trial, really is strikingly good data. So young patients given ibrutinib more of them were alive at three years than FCR chemotherapy. And that really did make the world stand up because we thought, you know, we thought FCR was his absolute standard. We didn't think the new treatments would beat that so early. And then the next interesting thing when Tate Scharnerfeld has shown this is he's actually shown us, well, what happens to patients who stopped ibrutinib because of adverse events? So I, they ran into a problem and they stopped their ibrutinib because we were all thinking, well, they'll just relapse straight away. It's not like chemo, it doesn't give them a deep remission. And actually quite the opposite, what they showed was it was taking on average about two years before the CLL woke up, because this is a Kaplan-Meier plot looking at how long after stopping the ibrutinib did it take before their disease woke up. So the messages here were, number one, new drugs up front look pretty good compared to our best chemo. And number two, actually, if you have to stop the ibrutinib for whatever reason, you might still be in a remission for a couple of years before the disease wakes up again. So that's the ECOG trial. Let me hop you to the Elevate Treatment Naive trial. So we were running this trial in Cambridge. So I had a lot of patients on this trial. And I'm very uh, lucky to be part of the writing group. And we've got data being going to be updated. I watch this space coming soon. But unfortunately, I can't tell you about it because we're all bound by confidentiality for the, for the conference. But 
So in this trial, this was older patients, the 17P patients were allowed in, and in this trial, patients were randomized to either the top gray line, which is a calibrutinib combined with abinutuzumab, so that's BTK inhibitors, a plus antibody. The blue line is just the BTK inhibitor tablets, and the red line is the standard chemo, abinutuzumab carambicil. And in this trial, exactly as we'd expect, again, the chemo-containing arm are falling off the curve, so much more likely to have relapsed. So under half of the patients by two years are still in remission compared to those receiving a calibrutin. And when we looked at overall survival, it was just nudging towards significance. So statisticians often look at this p-value and the hazard ratio. So a hazard ratio of 0.5 means that your survival of that arm is twice as good as that arm. And you've got to be a little bit careful about, um, uh, so your risk of death, sorry, is twice as high in the ability to my parambicil than the acalabrutinib. You can make these figures sound very emotive because you can take 100% uh, survival and 98% survival, both of which are incredibly good, but you can, uh, you, you can make huge statements about small differences as percentages. But the p-value is just knocking on the door of significance. So that made people sit up and think, well, upfront acalabrutinib in the elderly, that seems to be better than chemo and people seem to be doing well. And the four year data, we are about to present that. So if you are interested in this, just keep an eye on your conference. There's a new conference round just starting with the European Hematology Association and ASCO, which is coming up. So then what about the German CLR14 trial? So this is the trial with venetoclax. And this, again, allowed 17p deleted patients, older patient trial. And this was a brilliant trial because whereas the others were a bit weighted in favour of the new drug, because you just got the six months of chemo, but ongoing therapy with the new drug, those clever Germans were not going to put up with any of that. They said, we're going to have a very balanced trial. And so in the standard arm in this trial, patients are randomised to a year of carambicil. So that's six months longer than we normally give in the UK. A year of carambicil plus abinutuzumab or a year of venetoclax plus abinutuzumab. So a perfectly balanced trial. And what did they show? Lo and behold, striking improvements of progression-free survival. Again, the new drugs keep people in remission for longer. But you must remember here, both arms of this trial got exactly the same duration of therapy. But when you followed them, you've got three quarters of patients still in remission who got venetoclax venetuzumab as opposed to 35%. Now, these are the best figures we're ever going to see with chlorambucil and venetuzumab. So if you're having chlorambucil, perhaps taking it for a year is better than six months. But that's sort of an old story. And when they followed them up, up further, and this is what was very helpful in persuading NICE that this was money well spent for the National Health Service, because when you followed them up, at four years, 80% of these venetoclax penetuzumab patients had not been treated, as opposed to 60% of the tramsal of penetuzumab. So four in five patients, four years after starting, have not been treated again. So they're still in remission, or if they're relapsing, have not yet required therapy. We're a bit disappointed that we don't have any survival difference yet, but perhaps this trial needs longer to follow up. So then that takes us to the final slide, which is just the summary bit. So what are our options in treating first-line CLL in the UK? Well, we've got chemotherapy, immunochemo. So I've put a yellow box over there saying FCR and BR. Well, applicability is more restricted only to patient fitness. And it is important to realise FCR is for fitter, younger people. We would not be diving in, giving that chemotherapy to people who are less fit. Even if they were keen and pushing it on me, I'd get pretty uncomfortable about that. That with so many options that are now available. And then what about chemo-free options? So these are all licensed. I just have to flag that ibrutinib, you, within the NHS, you can't get that as licensed. In the private sector, you can get ibrutinib and combined with antibodies. Uh, but first-line acalabrutinib monotherapy is now approved within the NHS. So we can get that for patients for whom uh, who are not fit enough for uh, combination immunochemotherapy. Um, we are not able to give acalabrutinib combined with the binutuzumab. So that option is licensed, but the company did not provide any cost-effectiveness models. So that has not been approved. And the great success, and I'm really pleased for NICE. I'm a big, big fan of NICE and approving things uh, 
phrasing things properly and making sure we get access to them. And it is working well for our patients at the moment. And they, we put a, a lot of points of view to NICE about access to venetoclax combined with venetuzumab. And they have made that available for younger patients. So the German trial I showed you was for older patients. And we had concern that we might have some reverse age discrimination with this very effective therapy that we might not be able to get access for younger patients. If that is not the case, we are able to. It's just that when we're filling out all of the forms to get our patient approved, we've just got to say uh, what group they fit into. So they're collecting the data, uh, but we can get that uh, drug in our NHS clinics now. And that, I would say, Charlotte, is about it for my summary of where we are with treating first-line CLL in the UK. Thank you, George. That was really, really interesting. And I certainly want to come back to some of your points in the pros and cons section, I think, with our patient speakers, as I said um, to all, your, all you panellists beforehand, we've got a few people listening, I think, who are trying to make the decisions around treatment at the moment. So I'm sure they'd find further discussion on that helpful. But before we do, um, George, I wondered if you would mind just saying a little bit more about the clinical factors involved in choosing a treatment for a patient, um, just to, sort of a bit of context setting in case there is anyone listening who isn't sort of familiar with those sorts of things. So, for example, you've mentioned a little bit about genetics already and a little bit about age. Could you just expand very briefly on that for me? Yes. So, firstly, it's a very personalised thing with your physician. So please remember when you have expert panel giving generic things to just listen to the discussions and debate, but remember that every individual patient is an individual. So what influences decision making? You have the patient factors. So of course the patient's views and opinions. You've got the disease factors. So the molecular biology of the disease, which some are going to respond better to some treatments and some are going to uh, res respond best to others. You've got the history factors. Has this patient previously been treated? Did they have a long remission? Did they tolerate chemo? Did they, uh, were they in and out with pneumonia? What's going on in their general health? Uh, and then you've got the availability factor. What drugs can I actually access for this patient? And so all of those different areas come together in your clinical consultation. And as my patients know, and I see there are quite a lot of people on this session, so there probably are some of my patients here, that I like to have good open discussions and then leave points for decision making. Because, as I said right at the beginning, it's uncommon for CLL to be a rushed decision, but you should be able to mull over these things. I like to leave my specialist nurses, Gwyn and Sarah, uh, to speak to the patient separately from me. So I'll talk a few issues, they'll then discuss them, and then we'll bring them back in a week or two. Or now I Zoom or telephone on the things that we can do in a modern way, but to get themselves to, to where they are. If you want this, Charlotte, I can go into individual things about molecular profile and things if you want me to, but those are the broad areas I think of. I think there was one question that was um, not 100% clear on what mutated and unmutated was. Maybe you could just very quickly clarify that one for us. Yeah. Uh, unmutated and mutated IGHV. Let me try and translate this molecular biology. So B cells go through a natural developmental path. They start in the bone marrow as a very open, capable poly competent cells who do lots of different things. They come out of the bone marrow into the lymph nodes and they mature in the lymph node when they get exposed to bugs. So this is all part of the natural maturing of a B cell. It pops out the other end and then goes to produce antibody as a memory plasma cell in the bone marrow. So it goes to this natural path. In the middle of that natural path, the immunoglobulin genes get rearranged and that's the amazing part of our biology and how we are able to fight off all these unknown pathogens because there are billions of combinations. Now, lots of this molecular biology has come out of our labs in Cambridge. So I'm very pro this type of discussion that you start off with this enormous capability of your immune system to recognize stuff. And then there's this random shuffle of the genome, we call it immunoglobulin rearrangement, that creates these different bits that are able to recognize unknown antigens. And that's where the immunoglobulins are going from unmutated to mutated. So mutated immunoglobulins are capable of doing a more specific task. Now, CLL as a disease can spin off from those more immature B cells, those unmutated immunoglobulins, or it can evolve from a more mature one. 
So you could argue these are two separate diseases because biologically they are a bit different. Those more immature and mutated ones, they tend to proliferate faster. People head towards chemotherapy faster. When you give them chemo, they tend to relapse earlier. And so biologically, we've known for the last 20 years, 30 years almost, that they, are, they behave differently. And what is very interesting with the new therapy is that they seem to trump a lot of that old teaching. So biologically, they still behave faster. But when you treat them, those immature CLLs, which used to just spring back from chemotherapy, just don't seem to be doing that with the new therapies. We don't really have an explanation for why. But it's one of the reasons why we're now pushing it a bit further. So with my patients, particularly with younger patients, I really do like to know what their uh, uh, immunoglobulin status is, because it does influence how I think about their leukemia and also how you think about different therapeutic options. And a final question on this topic. Um, someone's asking about will they be tested for, for this before treatment? And what tests generally do you give a patient before deciding on treatment? So I'm quite simplistic and I just test them all. <laughs> so I, I think I do, I, I think sequencing immunoglobulin chains is sensible. It can take three, four, five weeks to come through. I know there's a lot of centralization now, now with the Genomics England, so there's a bit of lag on that. I do FISH, our lab run, our regional lab in the east of England run the standard FISH profile for 17p, 13q, 11q, trisomy 12. There are others you can do, but we tend to do those four. And we also have a next-gen sequencing platform, which you don't need. So we sequence a lot of different genes. The key one you should really look at is for TP53. Um, and that now is really, I think, a requirement. Of course, you can, and any of you have seen the debates, and I've taken parts in debates on either side of this argument, you can put a completely inverted argument and say, well, look, if you're using one of the new drugs, say you're going to give someone eight calories up upfront, why bother wasting your money in the lab? Because the new drugs work the same for all of these, so just stop them, don't test them. But I don't, I honestly don't think we should think like that. I think we should just do all the tests. Okay, thank you for that. Um... So just sort of going back then, I, I guess, to sort of the pros and cons side, and maybe I can bring in um, John to start with here. So George, very nicely sort of set out pros and cons of various treatments. I wondered if you, John, could say um, when you were deciding on your first treatment, whether you related to some of those pros and cons, is that the sort of the way you made the, dis the, the decision in your head about choosing your first treatment? Yes, very true. Um... I, I was very chemotherapy phobic. Um, uh, was the biggest part of my first few months having been diagnosed. Um, and then when my treatment date was presented, I was told by you know 2017 end of end of I would be treated. <clears throat> I had to focus in on what was going to be the best thing for me, and, and it was a very intense period of time. Uh, George doesn't know this, but I watched one of his uh, uh, lectures that he gave to some pa patient group, which I found incredibly helpful at the time, describing very much what you're describing now, which I was looking for that kind of explanation and rationale. Um, and ultimately, I, I um, got a second opinion. I went to see Professor Hillman, and that was definitively, without doubt, the most important moment of my CLL journey, if you like. And I wanted, at that time, a Bruce Nevin Venetoclax. I wanted this targeted therapy. Um, and Professor Hillman said, FCR, which was an interesting moment for me. And as I drove back from the five hours from Leeds to where I live, um, I arrived home, having made the decision I'd have FCR, which has proved to be the best, a very good decision for me, because I remain after three years in, in remission. Um, I'm 13 Q mutated, so I think it was favourable probably for me to have that with no other comorbidities. Um, but it was, a, yes, it was, a, it was an intense period, and I think this is a very important uh, webinar to help people navigate through. So you um, mentioned there that you were a little bit scared about FCR. So what were the cons that led you to being worried about it, do you think, and, and how were they allayed by Professor Hillman? Um, 
do I do I expose my past history? Um, uh, I'm a doctor and I've uh, had a lot of experience with um, patients of mine who in the past have had, I'm, I was a GP. Um, so I knew what chemotherapy can do. And that fed really into my, you know, my anxieties. I, I became a patient and I was no longer able to be my, you know, be the doctor in, in my case. Yeah. Um, and the switch I took, I, I received some very good counselling from, from a cancer counsellor and did some research, listened to webinars. It's all part of it. And then to arrive at the point of having to have my first, your first uh, infusion, I was, I suppose, at peace. But then, and a week after I started, I had a terrible week to start with. Um, I was amazed, you know, for me, it was amazing. And I've only lucky people who had a very easy trip with, with FCR. Great, thank you for that, John. I think it's really helpful to know your, your thought process. Um, Liz, can I come to you and ask you sort of how, what, which treatments you had and how you came to that as well? Yeah, yes. Again, very similar to John in, in one way and, and keenly different in another. Um, I knew I was ready for treatment. I had vast glands and they were affecting my health in, in various ways. So I, I, I was glad that the treatment decision had been made. And I had been on the waiting list for a trial for flare, which I think is finished now anyway now. And there were these marvellous uh, treatments on there, Brutinib, et cetera, being try, tried out, Venetoclax, exciting things like that, and FCR. And I didn't want FCR. It turned out that my, my CLL is unmutated. And as we absolutely all know now, that chemo doesn't really help unmutated CLL. Lo and behold, the computer allocated me um, FCR, and I was disappointed, very, and, but accepting, because I was loyal to the trial, I mean, this, this is actually quite a big message for me, I'm passionate about these trials, I, I think the work that's happened is phenomenal, and very exciting with cancer, and so the, to be on a trial is, you know, exciting for oneself, but, but it, one's doing something for science. So I felt a loyalty to my consultant and I felt a loyalty to the uh, trial. And it was when a friend who's a nurse said, get a second opinion, Liz. And it was for me, again, the best thing that I did. I, really, I went and got my second opinion and um, I had uh, NHS at that stage two years ago, I had to go on chemo, but I went on the milder one, the chloramicil and the binutiximab or something. And I went on it for a few months. It didn't really work on me. And I'm now on the secondary one of uh, a calibrutinib and uh, flourishing on that. I think it's wonderful. Um, but my big message is it's well worth getting the second opinion and don't feel a loyalty to the trial. It, it, your loyalty must be to yourself at this stage. Does that help? Yes, that's a good. I think it's a good message. Is it, it treatments about what works for you at that point in time, as well as the, the medical decision? I, I agree. Helen, I wondered if I could come to you. Um, so, I guess for you, it's about managing patient expectations about how much of a, a decision they can make. Because as George has already outlined, there are things that stop patients being able to access certain things, be that nice, be that their age, be that genetics? How do you have these conversations with patients? I think it's just <laughs> managing expectations. Um, it's, um, there's so much information out there. So I think it's managing what people have already heard from other places and, um, and putting that into context and what's possible for them. So what they may have read about might not be what's possible at the moment. So I think it's putting everything into context. Um, and going through what they've gone through with their consultant, backing up that information, giving them more information as much as they want so they can make an informed choice. I think it's, it's nice now that I think my role's become even more used, I think, than it was years ago because there are so many choices, whereas years ago there wasn't. It was very, very limited. You either fit for FCR or you had chlorambucil. That was it. There was no choice. Whereas now we're, we're flooded with new drugs, which... Um, and with the internet and things, people know about those drugs as well. So it's trying to pick out the right bits of information that they've read 
um, and put that into the picture of their own situation and what's possible for them. So some of the newer drugs are, are quite, that it expects a lot from the patient. So venetoclax isn't easy to start. Um, and it's making sure that the patients are aware of that as well, that it, it, there is a bit of an undertaking now with some of the newer drugs as well, and just being there for them and troubleshooting for patients really. So trying to get them through as easily as possible with whichever choice they go with. Yeah, definitely. Um, George, I wanted to pick up on something Helen said there about um, the newer drugs not all be, being all pros. There are some cons, and I think you put that out nicely in your in your presentation. But one of the questions we've, some of the questions we received beforehand were um, around the role of FCR in this new world of many much choices. And I have seen you um, debate this at uh, conferences before. I mean, why is there a debate about the role of FCR now? Could you just expand a little on that for me? Yes. yes. You must yes. remember that debating, you argue whatever side you've been allocated. I'm aware that we're doing this Room 101 at the British Society this week, whereas I'm saying lots of ridiculous things, which are <laughs> slightly alarmed. That's going to be put on YouTube. So. Uh, Caveats, caveats. So one of the pros, exactly as John illustrated, that if you have good genetics, so if you have mutated, have mutated CLL that is, say, 30Q deleted, these patients can get really long remissions. And so you can throw all these statistics around about FCR, about your risk of 20% of significant neutropenia by the end of the first year, about your risk of hospitalization, a 3 to 5% MDS risk, et cetera, et cetera. But if you've got good genetics and you're looking at that very long follow-up, well, you've got 50, 60% chance of still being in remission untreated at 15 to 20 years. So if you are 60 and fit and you say, you know what? I want that because that's what I think that balance of statistics favours my approach to life. I think that is reasonable because you've got to remember that ECOG data I showed you had three years of follow up. You, can't, you don't know what's going to happen to those curves dropping down. And the price might be that you might accept, I'm going to accept a 5% mortality, 10% mortality in the first three years because you know, I'm a lucky person. I'm going for the long stats and I'm going to be in the good part of the curve. You might take that mentality. Of course, the reason it's being challenged now is because venetoclax and venetuzumab is there as a license and an available option. And, which I didn't show you, the mutated IGHV patients are doing very well with that drug. And it's almost as if we've created a non-chemo equivalent of FCR. I'm saying that very carefully. And as Helen pointed out, starting people on that protocol is a bit of a pain because you're up and down and you, you start off with infusions to try and debulk and clear up, but you're up and down many times. And then your TLS escalation. The first two months on that protocol, I say to patients, look, we really take over your life. You're up and down here all the time. But people on venetoclax venetuzumab do not feel unwell in the same way as FCR. Quite a few people with FCR are okay, but a lot of people do feel really quite exhausted on the therapy, and there is the risk of complications. And of course, John has done very well, which is great, but not everybody is as lucky as that. So most people think the chemos are going to disappear from our approach to CLR. There are so many drugs coming that people basically feel pretty well on quite quickly on the drugs so therefore why would you choose chemo but there are the arguments i've just said if you have the right sub genetic subgroup it'd be interesting to see how it plays out in the next few years i'm sure um and final question again to you george before i hand over to, to Stephen for the next section but when we when you we when it, in the first treatment is chosen um is there a consideration of the next treatment? We have another webinar coming up about relapsed refractory patients. We won't go into too much detail, but do you consider what might be next for that patient when thinking about the options for the first line? So absolutely. The point which I was making about strategic decision making. So sometimes when I give CLL talks, I have a picture of a chessboard and you imagine you're trying to move your pieces around because you aren't just planning for now. You are planning for five years, 10 years, 20 years. And that was for using a time limited therapy because it gives you the concept of being able to reuse drugs. 
because this concept that you take a drug for a defined period of time, put your disease in a remission, if you relapse four, five, six years later, well, you can reuse those drugs, potentially, if we can get access to them, but we'll worry about that in six years' time. That argument has been there for chemotherapy for a long time, but we know that chemo, you have this cumulative toxicity. So the days when we used to retreat with FCR, we used to do it, but you'd often then leave patients transfusion dependent and panhypogamma, and they'd be in and out with infections a lot of the time. So I think that strategic planning, how you use one drug now to leave one drug free for the next that allows you to go on, is certainly a very real thing. Um, we, I'm encouraged by a lot of the sequencing data that's coming through now that shows almost certainly you can move from BTK inhibitor uh, to venetoclax, then probably onto these new non-covalent BTK inhibitors, LOXO305, that some of your participants who are really up with the latest data would have seen, and they probably are working in people who've been on the other drugs. Great, thank you for, for that. Uh, Stephen, I'll hand over to you. Um, I'm going to kind of focus a little bit more on the kind of side effects and all of those pros and cons you get, because obviously, as you said, every single treatment has side effects and different different things in there. But just before we go on to that, I've noticed there's a couple of questions. So we actually started off around watch and wait and active monitoring. And again, although that's not the focus of today, we actually do have other webinars where we, we have focused on active monitoring. So those are available through the Lymphoma Action website, Leukemia Care, in terms of past webinars. And also, I, I know that you know, it is topical. Lots of people have been asking a couple of questions about COVID-19 vaccine and the efficacy. Again, again, we may not go into great detail about I that. Stephen, you got to 51 minutes before COVID was mentioned. I, I, <laughs> that's the longest for a year. <laughs> um, we all have had a number of webinars about that as well, and particularly around the efficacy, et cetera. So encourage people to have a look at those. And I'm sure we'll have later webinars around that as more efficacy information and data comes out. And particularly the ways of supporting people as they're coming up to thinking about stopping shielding, et cetera, like that. But again, we're not gonna focus on that today. Um, so we mentioned about side effects. I think one of the questions there was around particularly around the immune system and side effects. And, you know, even talking about venetoclax and abinutuzumab, someone thinking about starting that now, will that have an impact on their immune system? Will that uh, immune system kind of recover from that? You know, that's the fun most fundamental kind of side effect, isn't it? What is the actual impact on that? Let alone all of the other side effects that will kind of come on to while you're having the treatment. But how do you kind of uh, address that, those sorts of questions? George first. Yes, so absolutely. The immune system, which has been brought into focus by the COVID pandemic and our CLL patients, is very topical in a lot of these discussions. So what do we know? What are the facts? Chemotherapy drugs have a higher incidence of infectious complications and admission with infections, without doubt. And that probably has a hangover for a year or so after things like FCR. But the counter argument, if you put a patient into a deeper remission, one, two, three years down the line, you can have polyclonal regeneration of their immune system. So there's more competent immune system that will leave them in a new, more immune competent state down the line. Of course, you've just gone through that period of more exposure uh, to, to problems in that depth of the chemotherapy and then in that recovery period. The newer drugs, they do work differently. So the BTK inhibitors, we know if you look at data that there's a suggestion of more infections up front, which gradually trail off. Statisticians get upset with some of that data analysis because because you're still on drug, you are selecting out the better responders. So you're biasing your data set. So if you look at someone who's been on ibrutinib for four years, by definition, they're a good patient because they're still on drug for four years. But you see the infection rates dropping. And part of that may well be because their natural immune aspects of their immune system are recovered. But the different therapies do impact on this. And that is a bit, sorry to return to COVID, but it is an issue around vaccination uh, because we've seen repeatedly that patients exposed to anti-CD20 antibodies don't mount very good vaccine responses. And we've known that with CLL and lymphoma for a long time. If you look at 
vaccination response to seasonal influenza. If you've had rituximab within the last six months or possibly even 12 months, then your immune response will be lower than age match controls. And that might be influencing patients. I've been talking about that today with patients. Do you go for a therapy which has a binituzumab in upfront? Because you will have to accept that if a new variant of COVID comes along and you want a new vaccine, then your chances of mounting a good immune response to that in the next six months probably aren't as good. So does that mean you don't then choose metaclaxib and atuzumab up front? But for some people, they will say, look, for me, CLL and worry of leukemia dominates my risk about worries about a virus that may or may not be prevalent in my area. Each individual has their own view on risk. You might be a businessman going in and out of London and having meetings, or you might be a 75-year-old lady living in their own house in the country that just doesn't interact with lots of people. And so this influences our view on infection risk, and each individual is different. But I think the different therapies probably do have a different way. So I think if you have to take all of the data together, the most immune-friendly therapy is probably monotherapy BTK inhibitors. And then the most immune complex, the most immune destructive is probably FCR. And the others are probably sitting in the middle. And actually, just to comment on that, so even before COVID was a thing, um, people affected by CLL were always having to think about uh, you know, going out and being getting any type of infection, whether it was COVID or other things as well. So again, you know, that is something that, although many people will be having been diagnosed with CLL during COVID, you know, that that there's a lot of information and a lot of support around how to manage that irrespective of COVID. So again, that's something that uh, both our organizations have support on. Um, I was just gonna go to perhaps Liz and then John, just about how you were made aware of the potential side effects or even when you did have side effects, how you then manage those um, and then come to Helen about what the team can kind of do to help people with side effects. But Liz, what was your experience around that? You're on mute, on mute, Liz. I'm sorry. I mainly read up about side effects. Um, and in fact, I think I was very lucky at, uh, when I was on the chemo, the uh, chlorambucil and the binotixumab. I really didn't have that many side effects at all. And um, now I'm on a calibrutinib, which is actually another trial, that's another story, but I've been very lucky there too. But I have read up about them and I have been aware of them. Um, so I've been lucky with side effects and long may that last. I think it's fair to say that. I wish yeah. that for everybody else. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a good point, because actually being aware of them is part of it, but actually even, even if you, you know, obviously different treatments affect individuals in different ways anyway so even Absolutely. though you may be expecting side effects you may not achieve any and you may not be expecting them they get lots as well but it's about how you kind of manage that as well um john have you got anything to add from your experience uh subject to my anxiety about fcr um, my first week was quite difficult i had blood pressure problems rigors with the first doses of uh, FC, uh, FCR treatments, infusions. I tolerated the rituximab infusion very poorly, went in over about three days or something, I think, in the end. Um, and uh, uh, I came home on the Friday pretty wrecked um, with my tablets. And on the Saturday morning, I woke up and I felt, I f it was incredible. I just felt all the symptoms of fatigue and ache and sweat, everything had just gone. And it was just like, you know, it was like a miracle, really. And I mean, fourth, fourth cycle, I was doing some mountain biking. And, uh, you know, I didn't lose my taste. I haven't got much hair, but I didn't lose anything. Um, I had a bit of, a bit of nausea. Uh, I had no infections at all. Although my lymphocytes did hit a 0.0, .0 at one point, And my neutrophils were running at about 0 0.3 for the the best part of the six months that was obviously quite stressful for me because I realized implications of that um and obviously I was high my immunoglobulins were low but I haven't had really any infections which is sort of a puzzle to me but uh 
maybe I've got good T cells somewhere. I don't know. But no, I've been very lucky. I'm, and yeah, it was an amazing experience. I wasn't warned that it might be that easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're expecting something worse, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so Helen, so I guess there's two sides to side effects. You know, what, what can people do if they're report, you know, reporting them? It, uh, and I think the other thing around that is that people perhaps tolerate more side effects because they feel that what you might do is take them off the drug and therefore that will be that will be you know means that they won't get the treatment that they're expecting to get so how do you kind of deal with and manage people's approach to side effects and also if, if they're starting to have side effects what what can you do as part of the clinical team to help manage that and alleviate some of those as well I think it's making sure empowering patients with information really so yeah. that they can easily understand that they're aware of the side effects it doesn't mean they're going to get everyone so you want to scare people <laughs> that uh, when you're giving them long lists but um, to make them aware that it's a possibility everyone is individual as you said some people cope fine and they'll tell you like, when they come back to clinic a month later what's been happening and you're like why didn't you ring me at the time so it's just mm -hmm. making sure people know what to what can be a possibility and what to do if it is happening to them so they know who to call to let you know they're not being a, they're not being trouble or anything like that that they can let us know we'd rather sort it out quicker than them wait for the next appointments mm. um and it's just empowering them with information really make sure they've got things like a thermometer just basic things that they've got at home that they've got a temperature you, you know what to do about it really and you're safety netting them all the time uh, and then sharing our information we, we share what other pa patients find has helped with certain side effects that um, just little things that can help with moving the time you take your tablets and things like that can all help so it's just making sure that people don't feel scared to ring us and let us know um, we found that sometimes with the newer drugs when Ibrutinib came out that people were maybe might not tell you everything that was happening because they were scared of it stopping it was a trial and we don't want to be taken off it um, so it's just making sure people are happy that they have a good relationship with us that they feel able to talk to us and that mm any issues they should let us know yeah and as you said some you know, even some of those what might be a perceived as a side, side effect may be may well be a different infection or something like that and again not to uh, be reserved in coming forward to, to ask and to clarify anything and, and they can come back in or whatever and uh, i think Stephen, can i just make yeah. can draw one point because i think john made an excellent point there that he was surprised by how actually he didn't seem to get so many side effects and i think that is we, I think it's modern medicine, isn't it? We're so obsessed about what can go wrong that you sit there with a consent process with somebody like me listing everything from, you know, your ears falling off to the final bit being your risk of dying on therapy. And the patient walks out of the room quaking. And actually, we should reboot the whole thing and say, you know what? Most people are absolutely fine with this. And that is also true with FCR. I'd say about half of people who have FCR actually don't have a torrid journey. They're probably not the ones writing on patient forums saying, just to let you know, I've just had six months in FCR, total breeze, off on holiday. So there is a bias of reporting for the people who are struggling. But I think it is a problem. We dwell on side effects in the consent process. And we worry, as exactly as, as Helen was saying, that the safety netting, because the biggest stress is that the middle-aged bloke who doesn't like complaining and he's run his own business and he's absolutely fine with his own decision making and then they're the ones who get septic in the night and they will not ring in uh yeah i just generalized that yeah <laughs> it's a good balance of that perspective and again you know things like leukemia care and lymphoma actions help and support lines are there to address some of those fears and concerns and getting the balance the balance right um just was going to have one last question before kind of moving on to a different topic because we've had some specific a specific question again about someone who was particularly on a brutinib and they had then uh, stopped having that because of side effects that they were having and since then they've been fine um, and so does that mean that they can't potentially restart it if they need to they're in they're relapsed um, they're in remission at the moment or go on to some different different uh, treatment how, how would you kind of approach that if someone's had an experience of having to stop a particular treatment because of various reasons does that mean that they couldn't start it again or they you would look at something else how would you approach that so that is a good question there are of course restrictions because of these restrictions have been 
put upon us it's slightly relaxed at the moment with COVID. But if you come off one of the newer cancer drugs for more than six weeks, then going back on that drug is challenging. Um, but as I said, at the moment, there are possible ways around that. You always have to ask why somebody stopped a drug. Was it an idiopathic random thing that's not related to dosing, say, or is it something you can restart with a lower dose? Can you give someone a, a, a holiday? You know, sometimes with BTK inhibitors, you can just stop them for a week and just say, look, let's get over that and then restart and see if you can clear side effects. Just a, a lot of the tricks. So the BTK inhibitors, I've written about calibrated. Most people are fine. Maybe 10, 20 percent of people do run into problems and working out how you deal with them with that individual mate might allow them to stay on therapy. For longer if it's a, a major side effect you know, significant cardiac arrhythmia or something then i think we'd all be a bit nervous about going back to it even if it was two years later so it does partly depend if it was uh arthralgias or loose stool or something that you everyday things that you might say look it's worth giving another go i think that's reasonable but there are many therapies available now for clr so there are alternatives that for many but not all patients that we can consider Thanks. Okay, to Charlotte. Great, thanks, Stephen. Um, just the one question, really, in this next section on preparing for treatments. I wanted to start with Helen. Um, quite a simple question. What can people do to, if anything, make sure they have a good experience when they start treatment or reduce side effects as much as possible, that sort of thing? Is there anything they can do to prepare? I think it's just trying to maybe gain as much information as they can so they know what to expect um, just managing their expectations making sure they know what to do if and when certain things happen so it just puts their mind at rest really what they're looking for and what to do um, making sure they've asked all the questions they want to write those down when they think about them and then make sure that they've asked everything so that they're clear at the time um, and not be scared to ask later there's no such thing as a silly question since some people get worried or they're just going to think I'm being silly but um, it's just write them down and ask and make sure that you're happy um, and question things ask us questions you're not being awkward by asking questions it's um, it's your treatment and we want to make sure that you're as happy as you possibly can and that you know what to do as and as and when really Great, thank you and then I guess um, similar question to uh, John and Liz maybe John to start with is there anything you did to prepare for your treatment? I think one of the most important things for me is um, is this concept of a safety net. Um, and my hematology, my heme team, dream heme team were very strict with me, perhaps because they thought I'd go, I'd go rogue, thinking I'd probably know better than uh, anybody else. But having a good relationship with the consultant, I've got an excellent uh, CNS work well with my GP and I think with a good safety net any of us can achieve or endure anything with the right kind of support um, and I felt that most acutely um, on the 23rd of March last year when we went into lockdown um, you know my, my safety net seemed to disappear and the, what, you know, the reaction I had was just totally un unexpected I mean obviously being resurrected and it was but it was all pretty flaky to begin with so I think that's really important um, is to have those good relationships and sometimes they're not easy to achieve. Great, thank you. And how about you, Liz? I agree completely. Uh, Leukemia Care, CNS, wonderful. CNS is at the hospital, wonderful. I don't know if everybody has access to a clinical nurse specialist, but if you don't, please do get one. They are just fantastic and Leukemia Care can produce one. Um, and the other thing I did to prepare was really to prepare my, my family and my home and that, that sort of thing. And... Um, I personally chose to communicate quite a lot with my um, family and friends. I, I divided them up into those very, very close and very, very dear. And I kept them completely in touch with everything, which is what they said they wanted. I did check with them. And then I had those friends who and family who are I'm close to, and they had, had roughly the same amount of communication as the first one but not as, quite as quickly. And then I had those friends who I see quite a lot of 
who would otherwise be worrying because I, I found that if you keep them in touch and let them know, then they worry less. And I found then as well, I could talk about other things in my life and not have to constantly update them about my, you know, I could get on with the other things that I wanted to be talking about as well. So that was my main thing. And I, but I also cleared my diary. The other thing I did was make sure that somebody was keeping an eye on my poor husband who had to keep an eye on me and my worries. I thought that that was who was caring for the carer. Um, yeah. And I, I found all that uh, reassuring for me because I felt my support network was in place. I totally agree. There's important points about an often forgotten group there, family, friends, etc. Definitely people who also need support. Thank you for bringing that up, Liz. It's really important. Um, one final minor sort of point that someone's um, brought up is uh, vaccinations prior to treatment and other clinical things like that. George, I wondered whether there was anything specific people should be doing clinically prior to treatment, such as vaccinations. <laughs> So there is an evolving data set on this that we know that CLL patients do mount recall to vaccines that they've been exposed to prior to BTK inhibitor. So let me try and explain what I mean. If you have vaccination before you start and then you have a booster on drug, you will then mount a seropositive response, i.e. you've uh, been exposed prior to starting the drug. If you're vaccinated afresh on drug, we know that the seropositivity rates are lower. And there's a paper that some of your really switched on people would have seen, uh, just published in Blood a few days ago, looking at the, the Israelis have done a comparative study looking at COVID vaccine responses in CLL patients on ibrutinib compared with age match controls. And we see that the, uh, well, sorry, in, in CLL patients, some of those are watch and wait, some of them are ibrutinib, some are venetoclax, and showed that actually the seropositivity after vaccination is lower in patients who are on treatment. So I think it is worth recommending vaccination. So the, the flu, the pneumococcal boosters, and now COVID to try and complete those. As I said, it's uncommon for it to be an emergency to treat CLR. So really try and vaccinate both of your vaccines. And a little ray of support. I've actually opened the chat now. There've been lots of discussions going on. Sorry, which I hadn't actually opened and read. There's, there's so much stress in our patients around COVID immunity. And so let me just give a few points there. So remember the immune system is highly complicated we can measure serology because it's easy you just measure an antibody in the blood but we all know that what your t cells are doing what the nk cells are doing there's a lot of stuff going on in the background that is much harder to measure and i know that patients are very keen to get their serology responses checked but many of them will be disappointed by their results and i know the reason i'm cautioning my patients before they check because you're well you're doing stuff your positive outlook and then if you get that checked and i say to you look we've got no demonstrable response in the lab you run the real risk of that mental health aspect of imploding and then thinking oh, i can't go out i can't do anything now it is a really difficult area because we all know CLL is a disease of immune dysfunction and we know CLL patients are more prone to infections. But think about the flu jab. Year on year, we're pushing the flu jab and year on year, do we, and I know CLL patients, if you assay their responses in the lab to flu vaccination, they're not great. But year on year, are we seeing lots of our CLL clinic coming in having died from flu or serious complications? Well, occasional patients, but not lots of them. And I, you can tell I'm a natural optimist, so I'm thinking there must be parts of the immune response that we're just simply not able to measure. So I'm saying this to try and say to our reading all the stress and what's been written there, that life has got to restart. As I say to my patients, you know, life does have to be for living. And COVID is not going to disappear. It's not. And I think we've got to all take balanced views on risk. As the prevalence of this virus really drops off in our population, the chances of you meeting someone with active COVID, the chances of you being infected is so much smaller. The herd immunity effect from the general population is going to be protective. 
And let's say if you've had the vaccine, it's hard for us to quantify benefit, but we're really hoping that the majority of our patients are going to mount some immune response that is going to lessen that risk of the severe COVID. And then my final point to try and, as I see all the, the chat, there's huge stress about the figures that are put there, mortality with CLL patients with COVID. And of course, I've seen the 33% from one group and 32%, but these are hospitalized ill people with COVID. And we know the statistics, whether you've got CLL or not got CLL, your mortality rates, if you are hospitalized with COVID are high, inescapable fact. But please remember, that is not for all of you out there in the community. If you get COVID, you have a 30% mortality. That's for the mortality if you are sick enough to be admitted to hospital. And the second, trying to be optimistic about the world, all of these stats are retrospective. Remember how we manage patients is improving all the time. Our Adenbrook survivals for COVID improving all the time because people were dying before we used dexamethasone early, before we were using tocilizumab, before we were anticoagulating people. So we have got so much better at managing COVID, preventing COVID, and managing the complications of severe COVID. So as a positive takeaway, try and get off going again. Um, and I hope that's the right advice for you as an individual. It's a generic statement. I think that matches nicely um, some of the messages in our most recent webinars on the topic of COVID. So please, if you have any further questions, do go back and watch them. They're available on YouTube. And yeah, there's some good advice in there. But thank you, George, for re reiterating that because I think we need to start uh, getting the message out there about uh, about COVID and, and how things have changed recently. Um, Stephen, I'll pass back to you. Probably have to make this the last set of questions, so feel free to pick and choose from the selection. Um, I think you touched, uh, George, about um, the way that some of the different treatments are actually delivered. And obviously that has changed with the kind of COVID and the impact of that, but kind of that aside, are there some therapies which only can be delivered in hospital? Are there some that can be managed in the community? And is that part of the kind of shared decision-making, particularly as, you know, depending on the individual, actually accessing hospitals is difficult, you know, isolation, transport, support, et cetera. How do you kind of have that conversation with people as well and what should they can consider? So those are great questions, Stephen, because, of course, we remember that CLL is a disease of the elderly and every study shows it tends to associate with increasing comorbidity. Older people have other health care issues and coming up and down to hospital uh, is might just be simply not an issue for you know, an 80 year old might not be able to do that compared to a fit 60 year old. So as Helen will know, we spend a lot of time now trying to manage our patients as distantly as is safe and appropriate. And of course the BTK inhibitors, tabula dibrutinib or acalabrutinib are easier to do that, obviously, compared with antibody infusions and venetoclax, as Helen mentioned, those first two months getting going on that drug are quite awkward because you have to come up and down. I'm trying to think how you could possibly do it, but you can't because you just need all the blood tests and trying to manage that in the community is just not going to happen um, in a busy clinic. So again, all of that feeds into that, that initial discussion you're having with the patient. Um, I think if I was told you can't physically see this person for six months and you have to put them in a remission, that's your challenge, Dr. Follows. I certainly would only be child. <laughs> I would only go for a BTK inhibitor or maybe even some little tablets of chlorambicil and to see how we got on. <laughs> because I think it, 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 it is difficult not seeing patients. I'll be honest with you. I, I'm not a huge fan of telephone consultations. I like to see people, but that's because I like to chat. But I also, I just, you look them in the eye and you can work out what's going on with them a bit better. Go on, Helen, help me out here. Tell me how you... <laughs> yeah, thanks. No, it's true. I, I'm, I'm, I prefer face-to-face -face than telephone because I think they can hide a lot on the phone, I think, can't they, for patients what you, when you're speaking to them. But yeah, the venetoclax and things, the patient has to be on board, I think, don't they, and commit to at least five weeks, six weeks of backwards and forwards. We try and do community bloods the day before we start, but that doesn't happen all over the country. I think it depends what services you've got. So there's no one size fits all for every 
every centre, but it's a, a harder one to start. But if patients can commit to it, then it's brilliant. It works fantastically well, doesn't it? But, uh, but it is difficult. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask another question. We mentioned a couple of things around clinical trials and people's having been currently on them or been on them. Obviously, clinical trials are a key part of this continuing um, drive to innovate and to have other treatments available. And we are actually having another webinar in a month's time or so, which is specifically about access to clinical trials, etc. However, before then, there's a, a couple of questions around you know, how are, are, are the latest treatments available in all hospitals and in all UK nations for, as a start? Um, and if not, can pe are people able to go and access that in different hospital areas? Or, or, or how do you kind of address that sort of question for, for people who are looking at their first line for CLM? So, Stephen, I assume if you're addressing that to me, so one of the huge advantages of clinical trials, it's not just the getting data for the future, but for that individual, if you are very keen on getting new things, and both John and Liz talked about that, uh, then that might be right for them. It's important that trials, it's just not right for everybody. The uncertainty and particularly randomised trials, people can feel very uncomfortable about the idea of putting themselves up for randomization. And of course, we've all had patients randomized to FCR who have chosen not to go ahead with the trial. And trials are new. Not all the new drugs, the doublets, the triplets are right for some individuals. They are appealing in many ways, but not appealing in other ways. So people have just got to make their own balanced decision, but they are undoubtedly very important, particularly these randomized trials. And the UK has a long track record uh, of advancing the field across the board in cancer medicine through randomised trials. And that is hugely dependent on the goodwill of patients who are putting themselves forward to say, look, we genuinely don't know A or B or C or D, which arm is better. At the moment, I must say, if I'm honest with you, I think trials have got a slightly higher hurdle to hop over because the standard therapies that we can now get on the NHS are very good. If you go back to when Flair started, you couldn't get these newer drugs unless you went onto a clinical trial. So that was a huge appeal for people to go onto the trials. Uh, th that doesn't mean we discourage them, but actually it, it means that we've got to design trials in a way that are very appealing. So it still has that appeal that people want to take part in. Okay, thank you. Uh, back to Charlotte's got a couple more minutes and then we'll be wrapping up. Thank you, Sue. I thought a nice place for us to end perhaps would be to go back to John and Liz. Um, so I think there's a, a few people out there who are um, in the position of, of making this decision in, in the next few days, weeks, months, etc. Et um, Liz, if there was sort of one thing you'd like to share with the, those people making a, a decision about their first treatment, what, what would that be? Go back to what I said before, of second opinion. It's really helpful. It helps to clear the mind. It helps to hear a different point of view. And the wonderful thing about an opinion is that it's advice. And the wonderful thing about that advice is you don't have to take it. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, John, how about you? I was going to say the very same thing. Liz. Um, <clears throat> it certainly helped me. And I think if you have to make a decision whether you want something or not, it's quite hard. If you say to somebody, do you want this or this, the decision start, starts to become a bit clearer. Obviously, it can get more complicated. But the other thing is that there is a lot of choice out there, as George has been describing. And I think that that's quite intimidating. Um, you know, which <clears throat> which model card you want to be in, the one with the GT or the GTI or the GTIS or the something something or whatever, you know, it's very difficult. And uh, it must be very difficult if one's not medically fluent to know if one's getting the best for oneself. And it comes down to the skills of doctors to convince patients of the relationship that they can trust them. But I think second opinions are certainly very, very useful and most or I would say all hematologists wouldn't mind. I can't believe that. 
I don't know if you agree with that, George. <laughs> yes, I must stress, of course, because I, I personally believe second opinions are very sensible, even if it's just a single visit, if there are areas you are struggling with. Our job as physicians is to translate knowledge, as we talk about medical fluency, that we have to translate information to make a decision point understandable, A versus B versus C, because modern medicine is the patient is and decision making, that's good medicine. Now, we all know in the clinic, you will have some patients who say, look doc, you know, my job is, I run a window repair business and I just don't know about medicine, you have to decide for me. So of course we have to make those decisions, but actually our job, if we're doing it well, and it's definitely not doctors on their own, I'm looking at Helen thinking how my <laughs> Paul Gwyn and Sarah get this landed on them as well, that it's translating that information so they understand for them, a binatuzumab venetoclax means this, a calibrating means that, FCR means that. So we've got these three options, but choice is a good thing. I know we can be paralyzed by choice, but it's a good thing. It's better than me just coming in and saying, right, you're having that sign of consent form, off you go, talk to Helen about the complications. That's a, I think that's a really good message to, to end on. It's, it's about, we talk about choice and we appreciate that choice is restricted, but there are still plenty of choices to be made within those restricted choices. And that's a really good place to, to end on, I think. Oh. Just to highlight on that, I mean, Anna, obviously we think that in for information and being as informed as possible means you have better outcomes. And again, that's what yep. leukemia care and lymphoma action here to do in a number of different ways. And even if people aren't aware about how they can go and get a second opinion, again, that's we have information and, and the helplines are there to help um, kind of uh, enable that sort of uh, second opinion to be to be had. Perfect. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so just to go through a few of our services, um, obviously one of those is webinars uh, like we're doing today, but both Leukemia Care and Lymphoma Action have uh, various mediums, a magazine, newsletters, podcasts, our social media pages. So um, do look at our website if you want any information about those particular sources. The one thing I did want to highlight, next slide please, is, oh, uh, formatting issue there, uh, our next uh, next slide, thank you, um, is our next webinar, um, which is on relapsed refractory CLR treatments. So second line and later, um, if you're just interested, you're welcome to come along, but um, it's, as many of you are probably um, still in first line treatment, um, maybe just share it with your friends and, and, and other people you know who have CLL who may be further along the pathway than you. Um, and here's a list of our support services if, if you feel that you're in need of support. And if we go to the last slide, please, there's our um, all of our contact details, both Leukemia Care and Lymphoma Action. Stephen, is there anything you wanted to add on the services side? Sorry, that should say Leukemia Care and Lymphoma Action. Uh, no, no, that's fine. You've kind of covered everything there and we've mentioned it as we, we, we've gone along. Perfect. Thank you. So I think we'll leave those up as we say um, thank you to our panellists today. It's been a really interesting discussion. I hope everybody listening has found it useful. Thank you for your time, um, for giving up sort of an hour and a half to, to chat with us about this topic. And um, to everybody listening, thank you for coming today. And um, we'll see you all again another webinar soon, I'm sure. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank